associations like, especially the one that Lynn directs, the Consultative Group on Biological Diversity, uh, the Environmental Grant Makers Association. But the sophistication that's in the room here about these projects is something that I feel that people in the foundation world really need to be exposed to more. And so I, I would encourage IUCN to be really actively recruiting people from the foundation world for future events like this. Um, Fred. I think in the question of accountability and uh, reason driven, uh, I think one of the difference is that I think increasingly we have a, a trend where we have to demonstrate our accountability and reason before we are actually doing something. And you know that very well when you try to get a fund or, or you need to convince your donor that you are accountable for the result of something you want to do but you haven't done yet. And I think we, we are uh, carrying some uh, accountability and responsibility and reason, but we try to do it after we, 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 uh, we, do, we do the project. And I think we can do that because we can leverage and decide to put money in some enhancement, taking a little bit more risk. The fund, for example, we are young, we've got a number of projects. After five years, three, four, five years, then we will look at, we are starting to evaluate our impact and our effect. Not globally, not necessarily at every single project and initiative we've been taken. So I think, yeah, I think we, we are comfortable, we, we are reason driven, but we are not having to be forced to prove that before we take a decision to do something. All right, one more very quick comment on accountability and then I want to move to the other questions. I think the challenge almost, a key part of this question is, is can we as foundations uh, transfer this wonderful escape we have from kind of box ticking short-term accountability, can we actually transfer that to our grantees so that our grantees have the opportunity for long-term transformational change? Can we do that in a way where we don't end up actually losing the outcome or Thank you. Um, I want to take a first crack at this question about urgency about climate change uh, and, and say that uh, uh, I was there with a group of uh, funders in uh, the UN conference of, of Rio Plus 20 and nothing very conclusive came out of it vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change. And I think it was in the closing remarks that it, it was the health minister from Costa Rica and he said, if you really want to get something done about climate change, the negotiations need to be administered by women in their 30s and 40s who have children. And then we will get something done about climate change because they understand that it is the future and we have got to do something about this. It's interesting that you don't feel the urgency in this room about climate change. I, in almost every room that I am in, it almost feels that climate change has engulfed uh, other discussions of philanthropy. And I was searching for a, a figure in my notebook. Um, the Foundation Center and, and Environmental Grant Makers track um, uh, US foundation spending. They, they do it from IRS filings, which means there's a lag. And they noticed that uh, the, the figure that's now available uh, is 2009 figures. And US environmental grant making at that point, and I realized that was after the downturn was at 2.7 billion. Funding for traditional ecosystems issues, land, water, species, had decreased 37%. And funding on climate issues had increased 92%. So there's a tremendous amount of activity. That does it, is it translating? Well, that's the, the larger question, of course. And um, uh, Dr. David Orr of Oberlin, who has written and spoken so eloquently on the subject, addressed our annual meeting this year. He said that how he explains it to people after working on this for many years is that they are not feeling it themselves. And so some of the work that we've been doing in our organization is dealing with the um, question of communication about the of drought and the extreme um, climate issues going on. Uh, certainly in the U.S. So I would, anyone else want to jump in on the climate change urgency question? Chris? Well, just very quickly, I, um, you know, it's, it's tough, I guess, when you're looking at it in, in Canada where we're a huge energy producer. Um, and the one point that I would make around political will is 
Uh, I'm not really sure we should be talking about political will as oil industry will, because um, at least in our country, there really isn't any distinction between the two. Um, so, uh, so, that, so the issue is huge and it's serious, and um, uh, but it's daunting, and I'm not sure that these solutions have been framed in a way that make people feel that they can actually understand or want to participate. So, I would frankly focus more on health issues of climate change, for example, um, as opposed to ecosystem issues. But that's just one one thought. Thank you. For the for the young woman who asked the question about um, will mission-related investing, um, Jessica focused on that a little bit earlier and how that's growing. Just interesting to ask how many folks here uh, on the dais uh, do mission-related investing with their assets of their foundations? All right, okay. So, uh, anybody else want to comment very quickly on that or I'm about ready to take yes, maybe just yeah. What I hear from her actually was even a, a different level, which we would call socially responsible investing. So it's the sort of first do no harm principle in your investing. And I think that was what I heard in the question. And then mission related investing, what's exciting about that is it really raises the bar to not only can you avoid doing harm in your investments, but can you actively advance your mission? So just a point of clarification. And, and from a, the point of view of our one foundation, I was very fortunate in uh, when I came there that my predecessor had already gotten us to the SRI point, the socially responsible investing. So taking that next step wasn't as hard as it might have been with my board. And they understood the trade-off and Thank they you. took it. That's a good clarification. Thank you. Um, Adam, did you want to I think the, the mission-based and moral investing side I think from my personal experience, and I really want to believe in that idea and want to get involved in that idea, but it's it's quite a road to hell to pay with good intentions. You know, listening to Ken's example um, about those people, you know, that would be a great project that I would, you know, 20 minutes ago funded. <laughs> you know, yeah. wow, this is brilliant. It ticks off every one of my box. I love birds, I love people, I love nature. This is absolutely brilliant. And without knowing it, I would have single-handedly removed a value system that had been there for millennia, replaced it with my value system, felt really good, hoped to make money, and next thing I've, I've given death sentence to these trees. So, yeah, it's something I want to believe in, I want to do. Um, I just, you know, caution everybody about the unintended, it's the, the land of unintended consequences, and you may not even know about it. I could have died thinking what a great guy I was for saving that forest. And, Five years after that died, it's the end of the forest. So, you know, it's just a portion of me. Thank you. All right, can we hear some more questions, please? Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations to this, to this panel. This is fascinating. My name is David Howell. I work in the Bird Life International Partner in Spain. Uh, and a question to pick up on this question of urgency and short term, long term kind of vision. Um, to, pro to be provocative um, and use language of war, in what's essentially a peaceful forum and a peaceful organization. Um, uh, in any battle there are casualties, and sometimes casualties necess which are necessary to, to, to gain the victory. So the question for, for anyone from the panel who'd like to answer is, for what sort of project with, with, uh, over the next five to ten year time scale would they be prepared to invest everything and wind up? Their foundation. Thank you. From a climate change standpoint or any standpoint? I, I don't see the difference between climate change and biodiversity arguments in, in the urgency question. The biodiversity crisis is equally as, as urgent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I think that one wins. Mine's much simpler. <laughs> <laughs> My name's in. Thank you very much for bringing together this belly of foundation leaders. Thank you, leaders, for your commitment to Nature Plus. My question relates to trends. I'm interested in funds for emerging leaders, young emerging leaders, and the two trends I'm interested in, are you going to get better or worse at feedback? When we put in a bid, will you get any kind of feedback as to whether the party failed? And secondly, uh, do you like us to add a percentage to the bid for an external evaluation? So we add to the bid 5 10% for external auditing and evaluation. Those are two important trends I'd love to. Don't comment on, thanks. 
I know an engineer. Uh, some of you heard my question before. It's about money. Um, actually, do you think that in the conservation world, usually funding is three thousand dollars or twenty-five, fifty? Do you think there is an opening for philanthropic funding for large-scale or long-term, which are in the larger number of scales and not for a specific time or lower numbers, but larger numbers, which are closer to the million dollar funding. For crazy as these may be, but they can actually be effective. I think we're gonna go ahead and hear all the questions and then sift through as many. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alice Kauke. I'm a secretary from Kenya. I will move our thinking away from money now to the environment and ask the panelists, um, in your experience, what should be the seven easy to quantify indicators of environmental sustainability that is relevant to Africa? Seven, because you're seven, so maybe each of you can just give us one <laughs> as we focus on goal number seven of the MDGs. Thank you. All right. Hello, Mary Klein from NatureServe, and um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you. I was really heartened by your responses related to ecosystem services, so thanks for the perspective you brought to that. My question is more around the um, uh, business approach to uh, conservation, which I heard mentioned early in your descriptions of how you approach your philanthropy, but then didn't come out so much in the panel discussion. Um, Nature's Reserve works a lot with both government funding and philanthropic funding, and I find it easier to operate as a business when getting grants and contracts from governments than I do in working with uh, philanthropists. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why I'd love to discuss with you later, but from your perspective, how are you um, thinking about the, um, the transformation to um, those approaches that make us efficient and effective organizations through um, the philanthropy that you do. Because I'm not worried about accountability, I like that. I, but I, I also want to be able to maximize impact under that accountability. All right, thank you. So Jay from the UCN Secretary in the Species Forum and I also manage the fund dedicated to species conservation on the ground. So I think we all know we need to do many different things, policy, ecosystem approach, uh, the capacity building, but I think the fact that this afternoon, for example, the world is desirable, we have to ask the question, saving nature, why bother? We are all convinced, but the outside world is not. So I'm quite worried by the fact that sometimes we confuse or we complicate the message. So one thing I found very efficient, because that's what is in the news, is species wildlife for the other reasons for the cloning outline is something attractive but many times when we approach donors foundation the response we get we don't do species conservation so that's something that uh, that is, is strange to me and I'd like to, to know if there is something wrong about the species approach or if we miscommunicate that because we can tackle many complex conservation issues dealing with people just by using a very simple message that reached the outside world. All right, very good. Thank you. I'm Julius Morgor, uh, Assistant Minister of Environment in Kenya. And uh, my question concerns uh, a benefit to a conservancy uh, in the rural, especially, uh, let's think, uh, like, you know, developing countries uh, who are probably faced with uh, difficult situations, hunger, uh, lack of economical strength, and so on. How can we make uh, these people be interested in conservancy uh, uh, such that it will benefit them uh, as they face uh, many other uh, shortcomings in life? Okay, I only have 13 minutes and I have 10 questions, so is it really short? Make it a short question and then people are going to get to choose what they want to answer, all right? Okay. Sorry, I, I will speak. Uh, yeah. 
that's burnt to prepare 20 billion kilograms of charcoal, uh, which then results in a 10 billion dollar um, uh, revenue stream. That would be one indicator, uh, getting away from charcoal. Um, another indicator would be, uh, you see countries, uh, we all talk about global best case scenario two degrees, but South Africa, for instance, finds itself every time the world goes up about one, 0 0.1 degree, they find 0 0.2, 0 0.22. So if we talk about 2 degrees, they talk about 4.5 degrees. Now, 50 million people live there, they will not be able to feed themselves when there's drought and they have to move away. And at the moment, the people are moving south, so the people in the south have to move away somewhere else. So migration will be a tremendous issue, and anything that can be done to reduce migration those indication figures uh, uh, will be. Thank you. Ken, you wanted to add? I think part, part of the answer to that question actually is that um, when you, hopefully there will be a time when sitting up here you have African philanthropists um, and the foundations working in Africa will have you know, many, many African staff and many Africans on their boards. And I think that's when we will.